Welcome to our weekly Book of Mormon Come Follow Me video, giving a little bit of historical context and content. This week we're discussing the first five chapters of the Book of Ether found in the Book of Mormon. And there's several stories that go with this, and there's lots of context. So it's a, a little bit of fun with this one. So open up to Ether chapter 1, and let's begin right at the beginning. Verse 1, And now I, Moroni, Proceed to give an account of those ancient inhabitants who were destroyed by the hand of the Lord upon the face of this north country. Right at the beginning, Moroni's talking. Remember, he's the son of Mormon. Mormon was the abridger, uh, the record keeper, he compiled all of the plates onto these gold plates. And now Moroni has them. He thought he was done writing, but apparently he now has more to write. And it appears that he is in the Northland. Notice how he says, upon the face of this Northland. So we don't know exactly where he's at, but he apparently is up north, has the gold plates, and now he's going to make a record of the inhabitants that were destroyed by the hand of the Lord upon the face of this north country. So it appears that the record that he's about to tell us about, that they live north of where the Lamanites and Nephites were living. So who is this record and, and where are they at? Now here we have to go back a ways to see where we're at and what we're doing here. So this is a slide that we did way back earlier in the year. Uh, just keeping track of all of the different parties from Lehi and his kids to uh, Jacob's kids, Enos, Jerem, Omni. Uh, and then notice we have the kings who had the records are the kings that were following a different line. And then finally, when you get to Benjamin, he gets the, he's not only the king, but he has the records. So where this record comes from goes to this group of people. Remember Mosiah, Benjamin, and Mosiah? That after Mosiah, the first one, takes his group of people, all of the Nephites, they flee the land of Nephi. They said, we got to get out of here. They travel north to a land called Zarahemla, and there was another group of people there. That there was a group of people amongst that party of Mosiah who said, you know what, we don't want to live up here. We want to go back to where we came from. So they traveled, and they had the war amongst themselves, and they went back. And then finally, Zenith says, I'm going, and who wants to come with me? And again, a large group of people leave the land of Zarahemla, go back to the land of Nephi, and they live there. And Zenith's son takes over after he does, and his name was King Noah, and he was wicked. And that's where Abinadi was preaching to him. And then Alma, one of his wicked priests, repented and took off. And eventually the Lamanites come and attack King Noah and his people and get put in bondage where they're paying tribute. And Noah's son, Limhi, takes over. Limhi's people were the ones who found this record that Moroni is talking about. Limhi's people gather a group of, uh, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, uh, kind of a Lewis and Clark expedition and said, we want you to go find our grandfather, Zenith's people, uh, Mosiah's people. So they go searching for this land of Zarahemla. Apparently, they pass the land of Zarahemla to the north, and they go way up north, and they see this land that's desolated. There's dry bones upon it, and they find a record, 24 plates. They can't read them, so they bring them back to the land of Nephi. It says, Limhi, I think the people of Mosiah are all dead, and here's what we found. So they hold on to these record, and this record and these plates. Eventually, we know that Mosiah, the second, Benjamin's son, says, Hey, remember Grandpa? They sent a group of people uh, to go back to the land of Nephi. I wonder whatever happened to them. So they get their own little Lewis and Clark adventure group, uh, led by Ammon. And they go down south into the land of Nephi. Eventually, they find Limhi's people. And Limhi says, Hey, by the way, we got this record here. And uh, Ammon says, oh, I know somebody who can translate it. His name is Mosiah. He's a king. He's a prophet. He's a seer. So they take the record back to Mosiah. So it is those 24 plates that Limhi found 
that become this record that Moroni is talking about. So if you go to Ether chapter 1, verse 2, I, Moroni, take mine account from the 24 plates which were found by the people of Limhi, which is called the book of Ether. Now, what is on this book of Ether? Well, Moroni tells us in verse 3 that it has the creation and it has all of the historical record of the Jews all the way up to the time of Ether. But he doesn't include it. He says, you'll know that. We don't need that. So, and then we get this vast list of genealogy. Now, normally I put the list of all the names on the screen for you to help you keep track. In this case, it's just there in Ether chapter 1, all in one quick, easy to read layout. I'll let you go through that uh, list of names to track the genealogy. So, but the last thing I want to talk about here is verse 33. It talks about the brother of Jared, and it was his language that was confounded. And we know all the languages at this time were confounded. So what language did they speak? Well, we're not really sure, but Joseph Fielding Smith shares a really interesting insight. Let me read you what he said. It is stated in the book of Ether that Jared and his brother made the request of the Lord that their language be not changed at the time of the confusion of tongues at the Tower of Babel. Their request was granted, and they carried with them the speech of their fathers, the Adamic language, which was powerful, even in its written form, so that the things Mahanrai wrote, or the brother of Jared, were mighty even under the overpowering of man to read them. That was the kind of language Adam and hit, and this was the language which Enoch was able to accomplish his mighty work. Now, Again, here's a little a little background. Remember, originally the earth was all together. The continents were all together and so forth. We know that the Adam and Eve was placed in what today is Jackson County, Missouri. So Adam and Eve lived there all the way until we have the flood of Noah. Now, tradition states that the flood of Noah, the ark landed in the old world, which Adam, or excuse me, which Noah would have called the New World. Present-day Turkey is where they think it was. And the inhabitants have spread over there. So now they're living in the Old World, which is their New World. And then here we have a record of the brother of Jared and his family and people going to get in travel in barges to the New World, which in reality is the Old World. It's where Adam and Eve lived here in the Americas. Anyway, I, hopefully that was confusing for you. I, that was a lot of fun for me. So, at this time, the language is going to change. And, and again, you know the story. You read the story. You're familiar with the story. I'll just share some things that might be uh, maybe a little bit different for you. So, if you will go to chapter 2 now. Let's go to chapter 2. Verse 1, we learn about a man named Nimrod. Wouldn't you like to know a little more about this Nimrod? So I'm going to share a little bit. Now, in the uh, in the uh, book of Genesis, this is chapter 10, it just says, Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Joseph Smith changed that. Joseph Smith said, a mighty hunter in the land. What's the difference? I want to read you something that's uh, pretty interesting here. This is uh, a work of uh, a scholar uh, in a Bible commentary. Just listen to what he says. This is Clark's Bible commentary, 186, if you wanted to know the reference. Though the words are not definite, it is very likely he was a very bad man. His name, Nimrod, comes from Marad, meaning he rebelled. And the, the Targum, that's the Jewish uh, scriptures, the translations, in 1 Chronicles 1.10 says, Nimrod began to be a mighty man in sin, a murderer of innocent men, and a rebel before the Lord. The Jerusalem Targum says, He was mighty in hunting, or in prey, and in sin before God, for he was a hunter of the children of men in their languages. And he said unto them, Depart from the religion of Shem, and cleave to the institutes of Nimrod. The Targum of, uh, of Jonathan ben Uziel says, From the foundation of the world, 
None was ever found like Nimrod, powerful in hunting and in rebellious against the Lord. The Syriac calls him a warlike giant. The word Sayyid, which we render hunter, signifies prey and is applied in the scriptures to the hunting of men by persecution, oppression, and tyranny. Hence, it is likely that Nimrod, having acquired power, used it in tyranny and oppression, and by rapine and violence founded the dominion which was the first distinguished by the name of a kingdom of the face of the earth. So, uh, again, in the history of the world here, we had Adam and Eve, and we had very early introduced these wicked combinations here. And there's two choices. There's, there's good and there's evil. Well, and in, in shortly thereafter, we had a man by the name of Enoch who said, I'm going to establish Zion. And eventually they would gather in righteousness and be translated. The, re the remnant were wicked and evil, and Noah had the responsibility of warning them to repent or they'd be destroyed. Later on, we now have two kingdoms. Melchizedek built a kingdom called Salem, where he became the king. Jerusalem, right? That's the righteous will gather on the tops of the mountains and build temples and worship the Lord God and gather Israel. Well, in this case, we have an evil guy at the same time by the name of Nimrod, who's, did, who's uh, building his own kingdom, the kingdom of, uh, of Nimrod or Babylon, where they were to build a tower. And some of these uh, uh, ancient writings and scriptures say that this was an evil, horrible people. The design of this tower was to get God to overthrow him, to literally shoot arrows up into heaven and destroy God and overthrow his kingdom, which you and I know is ridiculous. You can't overthrow God. But these people, as are people today, trying to overthrow the true kingdom of God on earth. So at this time, the Lord is going to confound the languages, scatter people all over the earth, but he's going to take a righteous group, and he's going to take them and put them back in the promised land, a chosen land, uh, a land which we know is where Adam and Eve uh, dwelt here in America. So in chapter 2, go to verse 13. Who is this guy, and what is he going to do? Uh, and verse 13 tells us that they're going to a place that is called Moriankomer. Uh, that's right there in chapter uh, Ether 2, verse, uh, verse 13. Now, if you'll notice the footnotes in there, it tells us that Moriankomer, and in other scriptures it says that they name places after the people who were the leaders that established the place. And in this case, it's, it's no different. The guy's name, the brother of Jared, is Moriankomer. Well, here's a little story, if you haven't heard this, that's worth repeating here. Uh, George Reynolds, remember early church history, friends with Joseph Smith? He tells an account of uh, the prophet Joseph Smith, and, and this is what he says. While residing in Kirtland, Elder Reynolds, Reynolds Cahoon had a son born to him. One day, when President Joseph Smith was passing his door, he called the prophet in and asked him to bless and name the baby. Joseph did so and gave the, gave the boy the name of Mahanre Moriankomer. When he had finished the blessing, he, had, he laid the child in the bed and turned to Elder Cahoon and said, The name I have given your son is the name of the brother of Jared. The Lord had just shown or revealed it to me. Elder William F. Cahoon, who was standing nearby, heard the prophet make this statement to his father. And this was the first time the name of the brother of Jared was known in the church in this dispensation. And that was originally recorded in the Juvenile Instructor in 1892. Kind of a fun story. You can learn a few lessons from this. Don't ask someone to name your son unless you're willing to accept the name Mohanrai Moriankum or whatever it might be. But what a fun story. This kid gets his name and he grows up and he realizes that in the scriptures it never mentions the name. Maybe because Mahanre Moriankar was longer to write or too difficult. I don't know. But in this case, in the scriptures, in the book of Ether, he's known as the brother of Jared. So, you know the story. Brother of Jared uh, needs to gather all this stuff and he's going to gather the family and friends and they're going to 
leave. Well, what do they take? It is interesting in, in Ether 2, verse 2 and 3, that they take snares to catch fowls. No, when we get fowls, we use shotguns today, right? But in their day, they actually set snares so when the birds came down, they would entrap them. They also took fish. That's interesting. Why would you take fish crossing the water? Well, they did, and they put them in these vessels to hold the water. Verse 3, uh, carried with them Deseret, which we know is uh, honey uh, and the bees. That's why the state of Utah is named, originally Brigham Young wanted to call it the state of Deseret. He wanted his people to be industrious, working together like uh, bees in a hive. And then seeds of every kind. So what was already here in America? I, I, we don't know. But in this case, we know that they took seeds, bees, and fish, and fowls. So when they are land here in the America, they change the environment by what they brought with them. Some great things in here. So let's do a little bit more sacred things right now. And I'll just touch on this brightly. I think it is interesting to know that in verse 13, we already mentioned the name of Hanrai Moriankamer, but they were in the seashore for the space of four years prior to building the boats. And in verse 14, when the Lord chastens the brother of Jared for not calling upon him, really, the brother of Jared, I think, is a very, very righteous man. And, and you'll see why here in a few moments. But uh, at this case, he's chastened for not doing something, not uh, crying unto the Lord through prayer uh, to the same level that the Lord feels he should have. So maybe there's a, a lesson in are our prayers just repetitious prayers or are we fully crying unto the Lord? Also in here, there's the decision about building the boat. Uh, what are they going to be like? And there have been many great talks in General Conference about building the boat and how the Lord helps us with this. Let me just share a couple of things. Remember, there's three problems, uh, three challenges in there that they need to overcome. Uh, the Verse 19 states them, there's no light. Whether should we steer? And also we shall perish, for in them we cannot breathe. In other words, there's no light. We can't steer the boats. And there's no air to breathe. How are we going to do that? Well, sometimes the Lord just tells us what to do. In verse 20, the Lord tells the brother of Jared, put a hole on top and a hole in the bottom. You'll get your air that way. Sometimes we pray, Heavenly Father, here's my problem. And he'll just say, here's your solution. Verse 23, what do we do to have light? Sometimes the Lord has us solve our own problems. In this case, the brother of Jared came up with a solution. They molten glass or stones like glass. I don't know, somehow this clear uh, stone. And he takes the his 16 stones, two per boat, apparently, because there's eight boat or barges. He says, Lord, if you'll touch them and make them light, glow. Uh in, uh, interesting enough that in the Jewish translation of the scriptures, that's what uh, Noah had on the ark for light, were glowing stones of some sort. So maybe he gets that idea from there. I think that's interesting. But that's sometimes what, how the Lord answers. And then in verse 24, we get the third type of solution to our problems. The Lord says, don't worry about steering the boat. I'm taking care of that. Sometimes God's answer is, don't worry about it. I'm just going to take care of it. You don't have to do anything. So again, in my life, I think there's three answers to my questions. One is, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Sometimes the Lord says, you go do this. And other times he says, you come up with a solution. And we see all three of these in this case to help solve these problems. So let's go to chapter 3. To see something that's pretty incredible. Chapter 3. Starting, well, here's the whole collection of the stones. And the Lord touches them one by one. And the brother of Jared sees the finger of the Lord. I'm just going to invite you to look at this with a different set of eyes. This is one of those special experiences where someone has the privilege of seeing the Lord. 
uh, in the scriptures that's called uh, receiving your calling and election, or in this case, it's a second comforter. It's a very special experience where not only does the brother of Jared know that he's in good standing with the Lord, but has the privilege of seeing him. Now in here it says, no one before me has seen the presence of the Lord, which we know is not accurate, at least from our understanding, because we know others previously have. But uh, Elder Holland gave some great response in his uh, book about the, the, the New Covenant, the Book of Mormon. He says that no one, <clears throat> this is the first time where the Lord didn't institute his visitation to uh, an individual. It was solely on the righteousness of the brother of Jared. Again, there's some great things in there. So if you'll just look at it from that point of view, as you read through chapter 3 here, you'll see the temple and the pattern that we go through the temple. Think about that. There's a veil. The veil is parted. There's questions going on. Uh, the hand of the Lord is shown through the veil. And the brother of Jared asks questions and the Lord answers questions back and forth. Uh, again, a wonderful sacred type of, of the temple of how we come back into the presence of the Lord which is the exact language that it uh, uses here in Ether. So have that spiritual experience as you study this. Let's go on to our last two chapters. Chapter 4 here for a moment. Chapter 4, the Jaredite record is to be sealed up. In other words, the Lord tells uh, Ether that this record is going to be sealed up and no one's going to have it until after the coming of Christ. Well, again, back to our original chart. Limhi's people find these 24 records, give them to Mosiah. Mosiah translate them because he's a seer. He has that power and gift of God. But Ether chapter 4 verse 1, I'm just going to read this. And, and the Lord commanded the brother of Jared to go down out of the mount of the presence of the Lord and write the things which he had seen and they were forbidden to come unto the children of men until after until after he should be lifted upon the cross. And for this cause did King Mosiah keep them, that they should not come up unto the world until after Christ should show himself unto his people. So Mosiah translates this, and he's like, Christ hasn't come yet. I cannot let these records uh, be out in the midst of the people. So he does. He hides them. In fact, verse 5, and he commanded me that I should seal them up. And he also commanded that I should seal up the interpretation thereof. Wherefore, I have sealed up the interpreters according to the commandment of the Lord. So Moroni has these. Mormon has these. Mosiah's had these. They're all buried and they're hidden. So when Joseph Smith, by the gift and power of God, has the rights, at privilege, and commandment to translate this record, uh, he has the gifts, the tools, and the, the record that will be. So when are they going to come forth? Well, verse 6, For the Lord said unto me, They shall not go forth unto the Gentiles until the day that they shall repent. So how do we know? <clears throat> we have the record today. We're reading the book of Ether. Uh, in Joseph Smith's day, for the first time ever, except for the rare occasion of a few historians who were commanded to hide them up, so we're in living in the day when we've been commanded to repent and we have people repenting and we have the privilege of having this record brought before us. So some great things. Verse 17, same Ether chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore, when ye shall receive this record, ye may know that the work of the Father has commenced upon all the face of the land, which is today. So when you get the record, I have the record, we're reading the record now, we know that the work is commencing the work for the second coming of the Savior is all over the earth. So what's the counsel Moroni gives in verse 18? Repent. Same counsel we get today. Repent. Change. Come closer to the Lord. Now go to chapter 5. Chapter 5 is a very short chapter. There's just a couple of quick things in here. Again, Moroni is the last person standing. He's got the record. He's got the instruments. He's got the tools. So verse 1, who is he talking to? 
I believe he's talking to Joseph Smith. Look, read it and see if you see something different. And now I, Moroni, have written the words which were commanded me according to my memory, and I have told you the things which I have sealed up. Therefore touch them not in order that ye may translate, for the thing is forbidden you, except by and by it shall be wisdom in God. And behold, ye may be privileged that ye may show the plates unto those who shall assist to bring forth this work, and unto three shall they be shown by the power of God. In other words, he's talking to somebody who says, you're going to have this record. Don't show it to anybody. You'll be able to eventually show it to three. And who are those three witnesses? Well, we know it's Martin Harris, Oliver Cowdery, and David Whitmere, the three that were chosen to be the special witnesses of the Book of Mormon. And then verse 6, the last uh, verse in our readings. And now, if I have no authority for these things, judge ye. For ye shall know that I have authority. When ye shall see me, and we shall stand before God at the last day. Now, I know you could take that two ways, but I think Joseph Smith literally saw Moroni many times. He was his tutor. He was his helper. He was his priesthood leader, training him, showing him how to do this, what the record was, what he should do with it, who the witnesses should be, and so forth. And then, again, you and I can say, okay, we have this record. We've been commanded to repent. We will meet Moroni someday. He tells us that again in Moroni chapter 10, and we'll be judged based upon these records that he has uh, written. So I hope you enjoy this and have a great experience. And then we'll do some more of Ether next time. Have a great week.